You are now live, Chair. Thank, thanks, Kirsty. We'll, we'll just wait a couple of minutes for, uh, for sure it's six o'clock. <clears throat> Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to this meeting of um, Calderdale's Cabinet. Um, thank you for, for joining, joining if you're live or for, for watching the meeting. Uh, on the call you see the names of, of, of various officers and members. Um, I should say that in addition to Cabinet members there are another number of other councillors on the call who are not members of Cabinet but may be invited to, uh, to ask questions or speak at various points. There are no apologies for absence. Um, before we start on the formal business, obviously, as most will be aware, um, sadly, just over a week ago, we heard of the, the, the tragic death of one of our colleagues, Councillor Marilyn Greenwood. Um, Councillor Greenwood did attend Cabinet to ask questions and comments on items from time to time. She was incredibly passionate about everything she got involved with, committed to what she did, and she will she will be hugely missed on all sides. Uh, and I wonder, therefore, if I could ask colleagues if we could observe a few moments silence before we uh, before we start the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm sure that there will also be uh, something appropriate opportunity at uh, full council on Wednesday. So item two is uh, if I could remind members to declare any interests you may have, uh, disclosable pecuniary interests or otherwise on items on the agenda. Um, you may choose to do this now or when we get to the item. We'll probably take the when we get to the individual items. Item three, admission to the public. There are, there are no confidential items, so we are not proposed to exclude the items, public for any items on the agenda. Item four is minutes of the meeting of cabinet held on the 11th of January, which have been circulated. Could I ask uh, cabinet members, are there any corrections or is someone happy to move these as a correct record? That's been moved and seconded. Can I see all those in favor of that? Thank you. Item five is question time. I've been notified of one, one question from a member of the public, which is from um, Andrew Tagg. And I think um, it's quite lengthy. I think Ian, we agreed you'd, uh, you'd give an, an abbreviated summary of it and then I'll invite Councillor Scullion to respond. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, the reason for the abbreviated version is um, questions by members of the public are technically restricted to just the one question. There were several contained in Mr. Tagg's uh, email, but uh, he starts off by indicating that he's someone who commits to work on a bike and has cycled over 2,000 miles around Calderdale since June 2020. And he states that he can categorically uh, indicate that he's never seen the roads in such a terrible condition. Uh, and states that that deterioration has continued through the summer months. Uh, he therefore asks of Councillor Scullion uh, if she could explain whether the roads um, are in a condition safe for cyclists to use, uh, why little was done to repair them over the summer, uh, how roads in a poor state of repair fit into a policy of uh, sustainable healthy transport, uh, and why is there a lack of secure lockup facilities uh, within the borough, such as would encourage people to perhaps use bikes uh, more often? That's the question, Chair. Thank you, Ian. Um, Councillor Scullion? Thank you, Leader. Um, I will, if you can bear with me, Cabinet, I, I will address some of the points um, that have been made, and uh, I will send Mr. Tagger a much more lengthy letter because he does mention a number of specific sites 
in his letter. Um, and I commend Mr. Tag on his fitness and his choice of uh, mode of mode of journey to work. First thing to say, of course, it's not been an average year um, for anything, including road mending, although construction has been able to continue throughout the year. Let me just say something about capital spend, not revenue spend, where we actually resurface roads. Um, we've actually delivered through the pothole fund. We've got more than double the money that we had in the previous year. We've got 3.4 million last year. And this year we've got 7.7 .7 million to spend. And this financial year, we've already completed 3 million 970,000 pounds worth of resurfacing schemes. We've got a further 461,000 worth of work currently on site in Calderdale and 890,000 pounds worth of work programmed in thus far. In addition, we've also completed a 1,450,000 1, surface dressing programme. That's a capital spend as opposed to the, the revenue reactive spend. I must just mention that in North Halifax in particular, we're finalising the consultation exercise for 8 million for walking and cycling improvements in that part of the borough. And we're looking at a similar level of investment in Northwest Halifax, although that will include some public transport measures and a further 4 million of measures being planned for the A629 North Halifax to Lingwer. We've already spent this year 30,000 on replacement cycle lockers with a further 40,000 in the pipeline. But of course, um, I think we could do a great deal more there because um, people now spend particularly electric bikes. People spend a lot on them. They cost a lot. You want to make sure if you're taking it to work and you can't store it in your employer's workplace that actually um, the somewhere is secure to keep them. But we've just been informed by the West Yorkshire Combined Authority that we've been allocated 225 thousand through the active travel fund specifically for lockers across the borough and I'd be very interested to hear in terms of any um, suggestions that the public have and Mr Tag about where we might cite some of those. We're very pleased to have bid for that successfully. With regard to the specific sites that Mr Tag mentions, Mixenden Road was recorded, it's one of the sites he mentions, on December the 6th but due to the proximity of the bend just by the problem, um, it will require traffic management. That's got to be programmed in, sunken manhole, chased with utilities um, and remediation carried out. So we do have a capital program in terms of resurfacing. We do have a revenue reactive program. We could do better, but we really are working to make sure that we do employ the money as best we can. And I thank him thank him for his interest and thank him for what he's doing for cyclists. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor Scullion, and, and I assume that will be caught in a, a written response as well. I've not been notified of any other um, questions from members of the public. I have been informed that Councillor Mrs Carter, you want to ask a question, although I don't think I've seen that yet. Yes, Lady Addo, thank you, please. Okay. Um, it's in connection with future council delivery plan phase two. Leader, would it be possible to ask for some clarity around the disposal of buildings as identified in this plan, in particular libraries and halls? It was specifically identified that community asset transfer would be considered if expressions of interest were received by the 31st of March 2021. And I would like to ask for this to be extended to long term leasing where cat requirements cannot be met, as happens on other sites in Calderdale, especially around leisure. Most people would associate disposal as sale of, so clarity would be appreciated. I have also been asked if an expression of interest is received to keep a library if there would be resources available from the council short term to enable the facility to continue whilst, the, whilst everything is, uh, is carried over and gone through. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, um, Councillor Carter. Um, if I go to... Um, Cal ah, just lost Councillor Lynn. She just lost her connection. 
Ah, uh, she's there. Okay, I'll go to Councillor Lynn first and then perhaps also Councillor Scullion if uh, that doesn't cover everything. Um, thank you, Leader. Thank you, um, Councillor Carter, for your question. Um, yes, you're right that we are asking for um, expressions of interest um, to be with us by the 31st of March um, for anybody wanting to um, look at taking over um, a former library building um, it, under the community asset transfer um, arrangement. Um, your first question, I think, related to whether this might be extended to um, to take in uh, a lease as opposed to a formal asset disposal. Um, that's not something that I think we, we had envisaged, but I'm very happy to take that away and discuss it with um, relevant officers. Um, I think your second question, which relates to whether there is going to be any short-term funding to enable the continuation of um, a library service, <coughs> excuse me, beyond March the 31st. And I'm, I'm sorry to say, but that the present um, budget um, for next year is predicated upon um, us achieving the savings envisaged in the future council um, report, which was released for, um, for implementation, as you know, before Christmas. Um, and so in the short term, the answer is no. Um, but we are very keen to work with um, local organisations who are interested in developing community hubs, um, sustaining libraries and so on. And I have to say, I've been absolutely delighted and really heartened by um, expressions of interest and, and um, informal expressions of interest, I should say, from a number of organisations. Um, and we're looking forward to working with them. And our library service staff um, are going to afford them every support that they can in bringing forward their plans. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think that covers both half of the questions unless, yes, I don't think there's anything to add, but we'll confirm that again in writing. So I haven't been notified of any other questions, so I shall move us on to the agenda. The first item, item six, opening more residential homes for children. This is a report or recommendation from the Children and Young People's Scrutiny Board. So I've got both Councillor Raystrick as, as chair to introduce this and also Councillor Collins to speak to this item as well. So Councillor Raystrick, please. Good evening all. Um, this is an interesting item. But I think before we start talking, we're gonna talk a lot about money in this item. And that's, although that's very important, we should keep in mind that outcomes are the most important reason for doing this there's a national outrage at the moment at the price of external private placements for our looked after children and in Calderdale we have an excellent in-house service really well managed achieving great outcomes even cautious estimates of the cost benefit to Calderdale would be in hundreds of thousands of pounds per annum in bringing uh, more of these external placements in house. I think those arguments are, are already made. What concerned the scrutiny board was the pace at which this was being carried out and would like to see given that the principles accepted a very fast moving process put into place to bring these children, these young people back into our care, our excellent care, it has to be said. I won't take up much more of your time, but what I would say is that what we're really looking for is a UK vaccine rollout rather than an EU vaccine rollout attitude. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Councillor Raystrick. Um, Councillor Collins, do you, do you want to come in next? Um, yes, just very quickly. Um, I think the Children and Young People Scrutiny Panel have every month, I think it is, that we meet. Um, we always have a report of some kind on our looked after children. We've looked at fostering and in the last couple of months we've been focusing very strongly on the residential places. Whilst we wouldn't want residential places to be the kind of easy option for everyone, we do accept that some children do end up needing residential places. 
And although we haven't got many children who are placed externally, it certainly is, um, I think you'd call it in housing terms, a seller's market, in that these places are always uh, extremely expensive compared with our local provision, and they're not always of good quality. Now, we have been reassured as a scrutiny panel that actually those young people of ours that are placed outside are in residential places that are at least satisfactory and many of them are good. But what we wanted to see from a um, scrutiny panel was that actually this is resolved quickly. As Councillor Raystrick said, it's come very quickly through to Cabinet from our scrutiny panel last month, which I'm delighted about. But what we need to do now is move quickly. So I'm, I know, I think that we're, if you like, knocking on an open door, but I would advise Cabinet to accept the recommendations from the scrutiny panel and particularly to try and move as quickly as possible to get two or possibly three um, places nominated, adapted and ready to take our young people so that they aren't moving outside of Calderdale. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor Collins. Um, Councillor Wilkinson, can I can I come to you next to respond to this? Yes, thank you, Leader. And um, I'd like to thank Councillor Raystrick and Councillor Collins and the rest of the scrutiny panel for all, all of your work on this. I think it's evident there's a real cross-party commitment to our children who are looked after here in Calderdale and that we really take our responsibilities as corporate parents very seriously. And I also think that scrutiny provides a ro robust challenge uh, but in a way that's fair and constructive. Um, and that's always been the case since I've been lead member. So thank you for that. And you will be aware, as, as Councillor Raystrick has said, there is a, a national care review currently being undertaken, which will examine some of the issues here in great detail. And I think that's something that we all welcome. I think it's important to recognise that for Calderdale, the focus on expanding our internal residential capacity is one element of a wider strategy whose aim is to ensure that our children and young people receive high quality support in the setting that most appropriately meets their needs. Now, our initial and continuing focus has been on support for families to ensure that wherever possible, our children and young people can remain in the family home. But sadly, that's not always possible. So we have reviewed and developed our full range of support arrangements for children and young people, including a new outreach team and a more targeted youth service to reduce risk and keep families together. But for a small number of children and young people who can't be fostered, it is necessary for them to be looked after in a, a residential setting with a greater level of support. We've worked hard to ensure that the council's residential provision is of good or outstanding quality. And more recently, this has been strengthened further by the reconfiguration and refurbishment of some of our residential provision. All these steps have been necessary to enable us to shape and develop our proposals for expanding our provision to be able to accommodate additional children and young people for whom it's appropriate. And we're now at the stage where we can progress these plans and we do, as I say, welcome the support of the, the scrutiny board in taking this forward as a matter of urgency. It's important to note that for a small group of children and young people that we're referring to, um, we have robust arrangements in place to ensure that they're looked after currently. So please be assured that their needs will continue to be met as we take our plans forward. And during the pandemic, we've had to really focus on supporting our children in care and their foster carers and making sure that our own children's homes have remained stable. And we're pleased to say that we have achieved that. The coronavirus pandemic has stretched our capacity, but it's allowed us to reappraise our need for foster care and residential placements. And there is a further review of uh, fostering as well un underway. We're now in a position, as I say, to take our plans forward at urgency. Um, but it is important to note that as a public body, there are certain requirements that we must comply with to be able to demonstrate efficient and effective use of public money. Whilst it's important to emphasise that our key driver for the work is the quality of the provision for our young children and young people, as, co as Councillor Raystrick says, it is of course essential that the financial requirements and the case is very clearly understood 
we're now at a stage where we need to articulate that case to seek the necessary approvals and then move straight into delivery. So Cabinet has requested a report at its next meeting in March, which will set out the business case, including the capital and revenue interest investment requirement for the development of the additional internal provision, along with the resultant savings that the fund will cost, that will fund the costs and the timeline delivery for delivery for the required activities. So I look forward to seeing that further report in March and hope that we can move this forward with urgency as you as you've requested. So thank you again, scrutiny members. Thank you, Adam. Um, could I check any other cabinet colleagues want to comment on this one? I'm not seeing anybody. So um, can I take it, Adam, that the recommendation is that we accept the scrutiny panel uh, recommendation and we note the uh, the action that's planned particularly report to the next to the next meeting is that, that that's correct chair yes uh, okay i'm quite happy to second that so can i see everybody in favor of that please that's agreed thank you very much thank you thank you councillors collins and raystrick um item seven are the Climate Carbon Neutral Fund. Uh, Councillor Patient, can I ask you to introduce this one? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, somewhat timely, given the anniversary of Storm Kira this week and some of the more recent near-miss flooding events that, we're having it, ha that we've had here in Calderdale that really highlight the fact that we're living the climate emergency and that we understand the need to act and act fast, really. Uh, clearly, this £1 million is a drop in the ocean comparatively in terms of what we need to get to net zero. Uh, the UK still isn't on track to meet its net zero target. And to achieve those greater cuts, the government will need to continue to cut carbon from its power grid, um, but also do so much more in thinking about the economy, transport, housing and agriculture. That's according to the Committee on Climate Change report. But what's really important is that to tackle emissions from those sectors are going to be made at a local level. Um, and it's really important that places like Calderdale start to make these changes. Um, this million pounds isn't to be taken in isolation. It's part of a broader suite of work in terms of us putting climate emergency right at the top of our council priorities. And that's alongside other things that perfectly match it in terms of uh, equalities and building sustainable towns. They all fit quite quite well together really. So this is a million pound budget that was added last year. Um, like I said, this is a, a, aside from the, all, all those facts and the um, money that we attract here in Calderdale um, in terms of capital projects, like the future high streets money, the station gateway, um, the town's money, and actually embedding the, the idea of decarbonisation and the climate emergency within, within those at, at the level what this million pounds will help us do though is two things um we'll be able to ring fence half of that money for internal projects and we've got a really good um couple of forums that can manage and scrutinize how these are being spent we've got the climate emergency Op officer forum that um that can look at those internal projects and which will have oversight from myself and and, and other councillors um and what but what's most exciting is the other half um which is very much focused towards the voluntary community sector, um, especially young people actually, who we're really excited to hear the ideas from. And we're gonna work with Community Foundation for Calderdale. In fact, we've already had some um, opening meetings about how, how they can attract some serious cap um, match funding towards that 500,000 pound that we've put aside. And that'll do two things. That'll obviously widen the scope of what people can bid for. We, we're thinking about how we balance it in terms of loans and grants, um, and thinking about how that might work, but also widen the scope to be able to do some um, revenue um, revenue funding as well within there, because this is capital at the moment. So the more we can attract through match, the more we can actually widen the options for the voluntary community sector in terms of what that looks like. Um, so. We need to uh, we need to agree this really and um, people are excited about it we've kind of started that those initial um talks about it and we hope it's the first of many um we've got a great community sector here that are already doing um incredibly innovative work that have put calderdale on the map i'm thinking of the likes of slow the flow and 
various other groups um, that are well known by their amazing voluntary work really. Um, so yeah, I won't spend too much time because um, I, I think it's integral that we do it. So I'm asking Cabinet to move the recommendations that we that we okay this money uh, and that half of it goes towards internal projects and the other half goes towards the voluntary community sector. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Scott. Um, before I bring other cabinet members in, um, Ian, you wanted to clarify something. Yes, thank you, Chair. It's just to um, draw members' attention to the reference to council at the start of the recommendation. That should be just cabinet. This isn't a matter that needs to go up to council for approval. It's just for cabinet. Thank you, Ian. Because it, it's already included in the capital programme, isn't it? OK, cabinet colleagues who want to comment first have got Councillor Scullion. Thank you, Leader. I strongly support this um, uh, division of the money, as, as well as the fact that we are continuing to commit to it. I have to say, it was a dilemma, short-term dilemma, in terms of here's money that has not yet been spent because it's for the future, literally. Um, uh, easy, easy budget cut, snaffle, snaffle that money, make books balance, and that would actually... We didn't spend long thinking about that because actually that would have been wrong because we've got to, even though we're dealing with the immediate and the short term and emergency, nonetheless, here in Calderdale, as cancer patients said, we are living the climate emergency and we do actually need to, we need to begin to push that work forward. It's a really easy thing to keep saying, well, we'll deal with it next year or next year, next year. And then, you know, the, the target is upon you and you haven't put the building blocks in place. And this is, one of the first building blocks. I think the other thing is that it is right on reflection to divide it between using money to get our own house in order, which is important because we are a big employer, we have a big impact on our places um, and on the environment, and we have a responsibility um, to, to spend that money wisely and to really reduce our own carbon footprint. But I think the second thing in terms of community and and voluntary groups. Actually, not all the answers lie with the council. And I think it would be very paternalistic and very old fashioned really to think that. And so I really do strongly support the idea that we try and encourage creativity out there. And as cancer patients said, also try and attract, use this money to lever other money into the borough in order to um, uh, give us some really long-term projects. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Jane. Um, I'm not seeing any other cabinet members at the moment. So, um, Councillor Dickinson, you asked to speak on this item and then Councillor Baker. Thank you, Leader. Um, the, I noticed that the, uh, the, the money that we're going to be borrowing is uh, for the next two years. Um, as it starts to uh, accumulate the, uh, the cost and interest. Um, my first question really is asking about how we draw that money down, whether is, is there a better way, because it infers from the numbers that I'm reading on the report that uh, the, that debt is being almost front loaded from the word go, um, rather than necessarily drawing down that money uh, later. Am I, am I incorrect? Right, okay, that's, that's, that offers a bit of clarification in, the, in that regard. So um, yeah, th thank you for that. Um, the other, um, question I really that I have is to ask uh, what assurances are the cabinet able to give to ensure um, that uh, we're both getting a critical return on investment and a carbon reduction audit um, to, to, to look at to uh, can be looked at so that we can ensure that the council is getting more than value for money for its investments um, and that it will in fact offer a return on investment that represents either a revenue stream or a significant cost reduction elsewhere. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, with the um, the excellent work with the LEDs as a cost reduction, effectively becoming a, a revenue stream as well. Um, I, I hope I didn't make myself too garbled when I when I asked that. No, no, understand the point you're making. I ask Scott to come back on that one first. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, thank thank you, Councillor Dickerson. So you raise a valid point, and those initial discussions we've been having with um, community foundation in terms of the um, in terms of the voluntary pot uh, will be run in a similar way that they've run their other grant operations where they've had a board that are actually scrutinising them all. And we've been quite clear that we want to be able to demonstrate the carbon savings or the fact that, you know, that projects can wash their own face and hopefully more within all that. 
and we'll make sure we have those same mechanisms in place in house as well um, and that we have the climate cha climate change officer forum and indeed our forum at the working party looking at any ideas that come forward and making sure that scrutiny is baked in right from the start thanks council patient um councillor baker Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, very pleased to see this money and uh, it going into projects to help tackle uh, climate change. You know, we absolutely need to be leading on this at the local level um, as well. Uh, I, I think, you know, the investment in our own um, properties is going to be good because we'll be saving money on the energy bills as well there um, from that. So that absolutely makes sense. And I think um, using another chunk of it to... Uh, um, encourage people to come forward in the voluntary sector is also good use. Um, however, the only slight issue with some of the voluntary sector stuff is that it does tend to go to um, more affluent areas where you have more established uh, community groups. So when thinking about this, I wonder if we could perhaps wonder how we can actually work with some of the communities where there aren't as many active community groups and, and try and support some community groups and work with our you know communities teams um, Halifax North and East, um, other central groups in order to ensure that there is a kind of reasonable spread uh, of projects across the borough. Right, thanks, uh, thanks, James. Um, Scott, do you want to come back on that? And I know Councillor yeah. Baker wants to comment as well. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Totally agree with Councillor Baker on that and in fact raised those very issues at our first meeting with CFFC the other day. Um, I think using how they've um, actually put the money out through um, some of their other projects like Never Hungry Again and stuff has been really good in terms of that geographical spread. It's made sure that it's taken people from areas like Central Halifax and North Halifax and made sure that the money's actually got that got out there equitably. So I guess try not to reinvent the wheel too much with that. But yeah, I totally take your point because I think we all know the Upper Valley somewhat has hoarded voluntary sector money in the past and I, I'm making sure that geographical spread makes sense for everyone in the borough is going to be really important to do that so take your point entirely and um, yeah make sure that that's um, kept as a priority. Thank, thank you Scott. Councillor Dacre. Thank you Chair. Uh, well yes I was just going to come back in first of all on what um, Councillor Dickinson had said um, just to try and reassure him a little more is that if you look at 5.4, for instance, it's talking about how um, we're going to have to establish how applications are scored and assessed. So clearly that's going to be a very important part of ensuring that um, what is, the money is actually given to is actually um, well constructed and well thought through. And then again, further on at the end of paragraph six, um, there's reference to what we expect one million pounds worth of investment to deliver in terms of carbon. So again, there are there is a, a, a not, it says it, it's it, the, the report does make it clear it can be very difficult to know in advance what these things are going to look like. But I think there's already an indication there that we have been thinking about how we are going to measure these things and how we are going to ensure that those who are involved um, understand what they're doing. Um, just then in relation to CFFC, uh, my only experience directly of them is, um, and I am in the Upper Valley, but it's in relation to a grant they gave to the old library in Cornholme. And Cornholme is in fact, although it's a deprived area within Todmorden. So I, my experience of them is that they understand exactly where the deprived areas are and they are, they are not going to fall into the trap of simply perhaps lis listening only to those who um, are most eloquent and shout loudest. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay, I'm not seeing anyone else. So Scott, um, just checking you've moved the recommendations. And um, yeah, I've, yeah, I, yeah, thank you, Chair. I've moved the recommendations and just one final thing, uh, just to mention that Tomorrow, um, the Calderdale Council are doing a social media takeover specifically around climate change and flooding. So just to ask all of our uh, elected members and other people if they could take a look at that and share where appropriate. Thank you. Quick plug. Thank you. And can I see a second of the recommendations? Jane, thank you. Can I see all those in favour? That's agreed. Thank you. Um, item eight is the annual health and safety report. Councillor Dacre, can I ask you to introduce this? Yes, thank you, Chair. 
Um, yes, so I take pleasure in um, presenting this annual health and safety report. It's quite lengthy. It's got some very detailed annexes. Um, there's just a few points that I'd like to pick out and highlight. And not surprisingly, um, COVID is referenced frequently throughout the report. It's obviously the overwhelming health and safety issue of the year. And it, it, the report highlights how um, the council has worked hard to keep its own staff safe, particularly the many in public facing roles um, and those who ne necessarily have to work on frontline services. And the report also said to me when we were discussing it, people underestimate how many frontline staff and how we have and how hard we have to work to ensure that they are kept safe. And I think you can be satisfied when reading this report that the council has done just that. It has worked hard and it has kept people safe to the best of its ability. But um, the report also doesn't forget that there were a lot of people who suddenly started working from home and they also needed support. They needed appropriate um, display screen equipment advice and equipment. And also, of course, there's been a big focus on mental health and well-being um, both for those who might feel vulnerable because they're working out in the community, but both those who felt slightly adrift and uh, uh, working at home because they were feeling isolated and without the normal support that they might expect from colleagues. And of course, also, there's been the need to have specific plans in relation to any members of staff who might be clinically vulnerable to ensure that they also felt that they were also at risk assessed and that appropriate steps were taken. Other highlights are the work, uh, COVID highlights, are the work that has been carried out with schools. And I'm delighted that the Health and Safety Executive commended the standard of COVID arrangements in our community schools and also praised the risk assessment documentation that the Council has provided. And I think all those concerns should be very proud of those comments from the HSE and our residents can also that our parents can be pleased that such good arrangements were being put in place within some very difficult circumstances. Other points which not, don't particularly specifically relate to COVID are that the report lists the range of measures that are being put in place to protect staff from violence and verbal aggression. After all, this is not something, those are both things that no body should have to face uh, in the course of their work. And I'm very pleased to see that the council is taking active steps to deal with that. And finally, I'd just like to um, note the success of one of our apprentices who has been appointed as a safety and training officer in Safer, Cleaner, Greener. It's always pleasing when we see somebody that we've taken on as an apprentice get um, a permanent post with us and um, it's also going, going to be of great help to the Safer, Cleaner, Greener team for whom there are always myriad safety issues and particularly at the present time. Uh, so colleagues, the recommendation is simply to note the report and the work being undertaken to ensure the safety of staff and the public. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sylvia. Uh, Councillor Scullion. Thank you. I would ask Cabinet not just to note the report, but to praise the report. Actually, once again, a very good annual health and safety report. Um, and I know it's not very usual to mention officers by, by name, but um, Martin Allingham um, from the Council's health and safety team really has done a superb job. And I'm not surprised that one of the apprentices that he has been supervising has actually got a full time permanent job and they'll take with them the good practices that they have learned with Martin. Um, I thought it was particularly interesting and in page 18 of the report and, and table seven. Interestingly, you see a shift to e-learning and actually how people can get to grips with some of the aspects of health and safety through e-learning. And I note the numbers of people who've done the stress e-learning course, as it were, um, on online learning. And I think that's that's interesting. That is a sign of a good employer is actually thinking about the stresses and strains of the pandemic that we're all suffering from. Um, so I refer to what I said earlier, not just to note this, this report, but to actually to praise the work of the health and safety team at a particularly difficult and challenging time. 
Thank you, and I, I fully fully endorse that. I'm not seeing any other indications, and the recommendation has been moved and seconded. So, can I see all those in favour, please? Thank you. Okay, we now come to item nine, which is the Calder Valley Skip Hire Application Determination. Um, this is an unusual item to come to Cabinet in that it is a decision which would normally be um, dealt with by officers under delegated powers, but in view of the very considerable public uh, interest, shall we say, that there has been in this item, we agreed that we would take it as a as a cabinet item, um, not least for reasons of transparency. Clearly, this is not a normal kind of cabinet item and not appropriate to have a general three for all. So what we've agreed with the legal officer beforehand is that there are, we will allow one ward councillor from each of the three affected wards. That will be Councillor Wilkinson from Sorby Bridge, Councillor Mrs Carter from Ryburn and Councillor Barnes from Skirkut, plus one objector, Mr Pickles, each to speak for up to three minutes. And then given there's only one of them, we will allow Mr Krantz from the, from, on behalf of the applicant to respond for up to six minutes. Before we do that, I'll just invite Councillor in as portfolio holder for the area to um, give a brief outline of the issue that's here. But before I do that, uh, I need to let Councillor Wilkinson explain his position and declare his interest. Thank you, Leader. Yes, I have taken advice from our legal officer and have been advised that as I've opposed the incinerator for around five years now as a ward councillor, that I shouldn't participate in the voting for this uh, agenda item. Um, but I am advised that as it's a, a non-pecuniary interest, I am allowed to remain in the meeting and that I am okay to speak on the item as a ward member. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam. Um, Jenny. Thank you, Leader. Um, the purpose of this report is to um, review and determine an application for um, an environmental permit, um, which has been submitted to the Council by Calder Valley Skip Hire in respect of their site at, at the Belmont Industrial Estate on Rochdale Road in Sobey Bridge. Um, and it's their intention to um, run um, a small waste incinerator um, at that, on that site. Um, this, the, the report goes on in section four um, in the background to, um, to describe some of the background issues to this application, which um, people may recall was actually the subject of um, uh, quite a contested planning application, which um, in due course, was determined uh, on appeal by the government appointed planning inspector um, who allowed um, the planning application. Um, the council um, in line with the appropriate uh, section 108 of the Environment Act 1995 appointed a consultant, WYG consultants, um, to actually as a technically competent person um, to review the evidence and to um, uh, and, com and compliance with, um, with the various regulations and then to make a recommendation to the council. And the consultant's report is part of the documentation um, which members of cabinet can see here. Um, section six of the report goes on to look at the various matters considered in the administration um, of the application um, when, and um, which included a, a consultation period. And section nine actually refers to some of the issues which were um, which were reported on um, in that um, in that con as a result of that consultation period, um, the um, the if if the permit is to be um, is to be approved and that is the recommendation of the officers, um, then clearly um, the, the permit will have a number of conditions attached to it relating to monitoring and enforcement. Um, uh, processes which need to be undertaken by the council. The other matter which is also mentioned in the report is the fact that another that part of the site um, is actually um, comes under the auspices of a permit issued by the Environment Agency. So in fact this particular um, area um, in fact has, um, has two, two um, overseeing authorities if you like. Uh, I, 
I think that's all I need to say at this stage because I'm aware that a number of people wish wish to speak on this matter, including a representative of the objectors and a representative of the applicant. Um, so I leave it there just to remind people that the the recommendation, there are three options basically, which are, are set out at the beginning of this report. Um, the first is that the application for the permit be approved. Um, the second is that the application for the permit be refused. And the third, the third option is to take no action, but then in effect that would be deemed to be refused. And the, um, the recommendation from officers, um, because this is a technical, um, a very much a technical re report, which depends upon um, government um, regulations and indeed EU regulations, um, cabinets are recommended to, to approve the application um, because it meets the relevant requirements of the Waste Framework Directive and the Industrial em Emissions Directive. Thank you, Leader. Thank, thank you, Jenny. Um, so I'll now go to each of the representations in turn. We won't ask individual questions on them. We will simply discuss the situation, the position at the end. So, um, Councillor Wilkinson, coming to you first. Thank you, Chair. Um, as, as set out in my letter um, of the weekend, we believe that there's another option available to Cabinet this evening, and that's to request more information in a number of areas. And I'd like to touch upon two particular areas here, specifically the nearby wildlife reserves and human health. The consultant's report states that the impact on the wildlife reserves should be assessed. It does go on to say that an assessment of the impact is unlikely to alter his conclusion, but the key, we, key word here is unlikely. 12 months ago, some public health experts were still telling us it was unlikely that there would be a global pandemic due to coronavirus. Chris Whitty was saying it was unlikely that we'd have any lockdowns in the UK. We all know what's happened since. If there is uncertainty, as the consultant says there is, then in my view, the council has a duty to obtain those assessments to assure itself there would not be a detrimental impact on the environment. Coming on to human health, there is no mention in the consultant's report of what the actual possible impacts on human health could be. There's no mention either of particulates, which are a major contributor to poor respiratory health, and in my letter to Cabinet, I pointed out data I obtained from the Council's own public health team to show that rates of respiratory illness in the surrounding area are far higher than both the Calderdale and national average. This is likely to be at least in part down to the poor air quality in the area. It's well documented that we have a problem in the centre of the town and that's why it's an air quality management area. I do feel it would be wrong to permit this incinerator in spite of the knowledge that people are suffering disproportionately from these diseases, especially when it's acknowledged that inaccuracies in the modelling could combine to have a moderate impact on the AQMA. At the very least, we should be getting a proper opinion from public health experts. The fact we're now in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic with many more people being affected by respiratory problems makes this all the more important. I've been speaking to local people about this incinerator now for over five years and I'm yet to find anyone in the Ryburn Valley who thinks it's a good idea. Given the level of public interest and opposition there is to this, we need to take time to get things right. It's worth remembering that the planning conditions for the site have not all been discharged yet, so the company would not be in a position to start operating the incinerator whether this application is decided tonight or not. So I would argue that there is time to pause, get that extra information and advice that is needed. So we are sure that we're protecting the environment and the health of local people. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Ooh, second. Um, I'll now invite Councillor Mrs. Carter. Sorry, Leader, I thought I was going second. Caught yeah. me on the up. This is, this is, this is second. Councillor Wilkinson went first, yeah. No, I, yeah, I thought I was going further on the line. Sorry, you've caught me on the up. I'm trying to do... 
do something else at the same time. I apologise. I'm sorry. If if you if you'd rather if you'd rather I can I can. Okay, go I'm ready now. Okay, now. that's fine. Yeah, okay. Fine. I've just had to move rooms. Rotary happens here on a Monday night as well. It gets very com complicated. Okay, um, <clears throat> I've represented this area since 1998 and this development has taken many hours of my time. Concerns were expressed from, the two th from 2006 onwards. We all accept that waste operations have to happen, but it is unfortunate in this case that a sound framework has never emerged to work with the operator and solve the very relevant nuisance issues reported by local people. The current permit proposals and attitude displayed by the applicant's agent will not help the process of cooperation and understanding, which is urgently required on this development. And I applaud the work done by the Bembo Group and local residents, and especially the current detailed and expert analysis which has been circulated. With respect to the monitoring, Council officers seem to imply that there is no requirement for monitoring and it would be up to the operator to comply. They have also indicated that resources for expert monitoring are very limited. This operation, if not monitored on a proper basis, could be very injurious to the health of people living and working in Sobey Bridge and Dryburn. I know that the draft permit does recognise the Industrial Emissions Directive and identifies the sections in the permit where these are applicable. But as the articles are not printed in full within the sections, I have concerns that some details may not be being addressed specifically, namely Article 48, Paragraph 3, identifies that the authority granting the permit shall determine the sampling or monitoring points of emissions. However, in the only sampling point identified is the stack and no monitoring points are specifically identified, only that that the operator shall monitor. There does not appear to be any monitoring points identified for the council to monitor. And as the red line of the application only covers the building where the incinerator is housed, I feel that it would be helpful for this to be identified as confusion as the rest of the site is under a permit from a different regulatory body. So to avoid any confusion for the operator and for the council and for members of the public, I feel that the monitoring points in a schedule should part, form part of the permit. Article 50 paragraph 2 also indicates that the temperature of the incinerator should be measured near the inner wall of the combustion chamber and this does not appear to be stated in the permit as part of the monitoring. The temperature is mentioned, but not where the temperature should be measured. I'm also concerned that section four at 4.2 table three, heavy metals are identified. I did not believe that metals could be incinerated within this application. Chair, that's three minutes. Thank you. Can, can I ask you to have your concluding sentence, Geraldine? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, no, can, I, can I just add a, a bit? Of, can I just add something? What one sentence? Yes. One sentence. Yeah. The regulations are very clear. The cabinet must refuse an application if it considers that this requirement will not be satisfied. There appears to be much more information submitted in the support of the MIP application than there has been in this one. So why has the information not been requested? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barnes. Uh, thank you, Chair. I would, I would like to, to thank the Cabinet for the opportunity to, to speak on this matter, a matter that, in my view, affects the whole of the borough and not just the wards listed. It is therefore disappointing that one ward that sits directly above the proposed location cannot be represented tonight. We have already heard from some of my colleagues from across the political spectrum and they have spoken more eloquently and better informed than I. And I accept that this is a very difficult decision for individual members of the cabinet. I am 100% positive that none of the cabinet members wants this incinerator. But this process is quasi judicial in nature, which means that a decision cannot be yes or no based on personal wishes. I also feel that cabinet have been let down 
a, consul a consultant's report based on assumptions and potentially inaccurate and unreliable modeling and a recommendation, and we've already heard from officers, which is incomplete. I have written to cabinet outlining the main thrust of one of the issues that I have with this report and recommendation. In that email, I made my case against the use of data from a site 25 kilometers away from the proposed location of the incinerator, a site that is radically different, both geographically and topologically. And for anyone who has tried to get to Kings, Queensbury in winter will understand data from point A is not necessarily relevant to point B. And as we know, Queensbury is not 25 kilometres away. This council has an obligation to the health and well-being of all residents of Calderdale, and this, in my view, should take precedent. With greater concern on climate change, with concerns on the impact that air pollution has on an individual's quality of life, and as both my son and I are asthma sufferers, this does have a direct impact upon me and my family. Coupled with the fact that I do not think Cabinet have sufficient reliable and accurate information to enable them to make a balanced and fair decision tonight. A balanced and fair decision to all parties involved. No one wants further uncertainty and threats of legal action and or judicial reviews but to avoid this further information and clarification is required. I therefore urge cabinet to take the fourth option, which is not to make a decision today, but to request further expert evidence advice that answers the questions and queries raised by both myself, fellow councillors and residents of this borough. Thank you, cabinet. Thank you, uh, Councillor Barnes. Um, so I'll now invite George Pickles to speak. George? You are in the famous words of Zoom on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Cabinet. Thank you, councillors, for this opportunity. Uh, I am, as you've heard, George Pickles, and I've lived in Sorby Bridge since 1974, some 220 metres from this site. I represent myself and the Bembo Group, an informal group of local residents who respect the work of Sorby Ridge Councillor Austin Bembo, who led the way in the campaign for clean air in the town in the 1950s. If, as an ambitious waste operator, you select a site which has the following constraints, green belt, protected wooded area with wildlife, steep-sided valley bottom, next to a volatile Pennine River, near a residential area, with a public footpath across its main area, and at the fringe of outstanding countryside, referred to in one of William Wordsworth's poems. If you do that, there are bound to be challenges which the operator, the authorities, and the local community need to work closely together on, such that the operation is entirely fit to be in the community's backyard. Coming to some of the information that's been sent to you by Malcolm Powell, if I could just look at the overlap between the permits issue. Monitoring and ensuring compliance has been difficult on this site and will be more complicated if a third agency becomes involved. The activities controlled by the Environment Agency and the proposed CMBC license overlap and have not been properly defined. It has been confirmed by the EA this morning that the proposed dryer heated by the incinerator, is not included in their permit, and as such that activity could not take place. Any new permit should include all the land necessary to operate the facility for which this permit is sought. This kind of potential confusion between competing permits is why the Secretary of State recommends that one regulatory authority takes control of the whole site and one permit is granted. There were similar issues at Mirkluff where the permit for the same operator was refused and there was no appeal. Coming on to the draft permit. Examples given in the summary appear of critical importance. One is the breach of condition which does not require operations to cease until compliance can be restored. That means excessive fluid, incinerator flu emissions could continue for an undefined period. Secondly, the conditions confirm the doubt about the theoretical air modelling and raise the prospect of the chimney having to be increased in height if emission levels cannot be achieved. How would the council deal with this potential issue in the future? Would they revoke the permit or breach the proper application of Greenbelt policy? 
Thirdly, the draft permit contains no information on particulate PM 2.5 and PM 10 emissions and controls. This must surely be an oversight as such pollution is very harmful to health. May yeah, I- Three minutes. May I conclude with one sentence? May I conclude with a sentence? Uh, you may, yes. Thank, thank you, Chairman. I should tell you that, the co that to convince his colleagues of the importance of air quality, Councillor Benbow obtained from a consultant a sample of a part of a lung from a local deceased person affected by air pollution. He took it to the council chamber. The ensuing vote was firmly in favour of the Clean Air Act and its adoption in Solby Bridge. Please can we urge you to get the necessary information and make a fully informed decision on this important matter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr Pickles. Okay, I'd now like to invite Mr Krantz to speak on behalf of the applicant. Thank you, Leader. Can I just first of all pick up a few points that have been made uh, by the previous speakers? The first thing is that wildlife and habitat sites were fully assessed in the environmental impact assessment. The council agreed with the uh, applicant, the appellant, that um, there was no material impact. Uh, and the inspector in his decision uh, decided that he had no uh, evidence to the contrary, and therefore there was no impact on wildlife sites. Uh, regarding particulates, the council decided that the only uh, pollutant that they were concerned with uh, was nitrogen oxide, uh, dioxide, and they did not uh, oppose the application on uh, the grounds of any other particulars. Based on that council's uh, agreement, the inspector indicated in paragraph 28 of his decision that he had no compelling evidence to the contrary, and therefore he was satisfied that other pollutants were, were not material uh, in terms of impact on human health. So those two points were dealt with. So far as the dryer is concerned, yes, that has to be a variation to the existing EA permit. That variation application has been uh, submitted quite some time ago and is pending, and we expect a decision from the EA shortly. In terms of alleged duplication of permits. I've dealt with that in a letter uh, sent to cabinet today. There is no duplication. There is no difficulty. It's perfectly normal to have uh, two different um, regulated facilities regulated by two different uh, regulators on a single site. We did invite, before making this application to the council, we did invite the EA to agree uh, to be the regulator for the SWIP, but they declined. So we're left with no alternative but to have made this application to the council. The last thing uh, I refer to is enforcement. Uh, I said in my letter um, today, the regulations already provide for various enforcement options, including suspension. So the regulator has the power to suspend if there is a breach and a risk of pollution, it can do so immediately. It doesn't need a permit condition to do that. So now I'll turn to certain other things. Whilst I accept the sincerity of those who object to this um, proposal, no matter how those objections are expressed, what you cabinet are being asked to do is to rerun the planning inquiry exercise all over again, to seek the same information, uh, to defer this application even to seek the same information that was already before the inspector who meticulously, fastidiously uh, dealt with this um, appeal uh, over seven and a half full days of inquiry and lots of uh, activity in terms of requested uh, written notes, technical notes, outside the inquiry. No matter what may be your inclination, Cabinet, it ought to be self-evident that you cannot accede to these requests or go down that route. 
the council cannot, in effect, revoke a planning permission by refusing a permit and in doing so, reversing the grounds on which the planning permission was granted. Where air quality is put in issue at the planning stage, which this council did, upon the assumption that emissions will be controlled by permit conditions, the job of the planning authority is to decide whether there'll be any material impact on human receptors or habitats. The inspector, after an, after an exhaustive inquiry, decided that there would not be. Moreover, it is the agreed position of the council that in general terms, planning condition, uh, sorry, uh, permit conditions can effectively control emissions of this SWIP. That was so agreed in paragraph 33 of a statement of common ground, which I have uh, uh, sent uh, this afternoon and which I understand has been circulated to cabinet members. And uh, effectively what it says is the SWIP together with associated plant will be required to meet all statutory industrial emission standards. And under the environmental permit, such specific standards are applicable and enforced from time to time in relation to incineration plants for the protection of human health and the environment. The control of emissions from the flue or stack associated with the SWIP would be regulated and enforced under the pollution control regime in accordance with such statutory and other regulatory standards, and so as to ensure that there is no breach of any applicable emission limit values. So the position of this council, as agreed in that statement, is that in general terms, permit conditions will do the job. And therefore the only issue that is before the cabinet today, the only legitimate issue that is before the cabinet today is whether these specific permit conditions recommended in the report to the cabinet will do the job specifically. I see no. Yeah, that's six minutes. I see. Sorry, I, I see no reasons why they shouldn't. Uh, but uh, if you have specific recommendations to uh, add or alter some of the permit conditions, you can do so. But can I also make the point that under the uh, regulations? The regulator always has the power to vary conditions, including adding conditions, if that is considered necessary to avoid pollution. So they're not stuck in stone, they can be varied in the future. Thank, uh, thank you. So, I think, uh, sorry, so I think. Th thank you very much, Leader. Thank you very much, Cabinet. Thank you. I think most speakers went slightly over their, their time, so I think that was only fair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crowns, and thank you for, to, to all of the. Um, representatives and objectors for the, the way you've pre presented your, your information and your cases. Um, so at this point we need to move on to cabinet discussion and any questions. Because of the nature of this it may be there are questions for officers which we wouldn't normally do at cabinet but uh, can I ask colleagues if anybody has any initial um, points they want to make? Uh, Jane, yes, Councillor Scullion. Thank you, and thank you to all of those who, who spoke. And there is plenty of food for thought and there has been um, for this cabinet and, and for this council. I think it is useful to go back to the background of the planning application and indeed the inquiry, um, but clearly this is a different, different animal. This is a kettle of fish or the, the permitting process is different, and I, I have come to, to, to learn that um, in detail. And our job here tonight is about the environmental permit, not about the planning permission. Of course, the planning permission, the conditions uh, to start this work um, has, not, has not happened yet because there are still conditions um, uh, which were there in the planning uh, permission, which have to be um, exhausted or put into place before uh, operations can start. I think I would defend the cabinet in taking, taking this discussion in a public forum, because I think it's very, very clear that there's a tremendously strong public interest in this. And I think we were also right to seek advice from external consultants with technical competence. Um, 
I don't think any of us who are on the cabinet uh, claim to be uh, suitably qualified to comment uh, on some of the um, technical areas. We can certainly interrogate those things, um, but certainly don't have the technical competence um, uh, to pronounce uh, upon them. I think also we're absolutely right to require due diligence from our officers and the consultants uh, that we have used to take another view on this of whether everything has been done in terms of due diligence. Um, and that's what you have before you tonight. I just wanted to say three things really that are really on my mind as I hear protesters and the applicant speak. And one of those is a heart of the matter is the question of monitoring and enforcement. You know, what is the role of those who regulate this site, the Environment Agency and the local council? We really do have to be, um, in any of these situations, we have to be absolutely diligent in monitoring. And I think we need to think as we go forward, given what we've previously been speaking about in this cabinet about environmental issues, we actually have to find new ways of making sure that we um, exercise our duties in a way that really, really is about the kind of enforcement and monitoring that the public, public would expect. I think the other thing, and it may be that colleagues want to come in here as well, is I certainly feel that the planning process alongside the permitting process in terms of the environmental permits does need, in relation to controversial issues like incinerators, does really need, it needs to be changed. You know, central government needs to look at this very actively. And I do think as a cabinet, as a council, we should be lobbying government, pressing government really to take a fresh look at these, these processes. Um, and also to, to give, give due weight to to local local decision making and, and local local concerns. I think the third thing is, is something that's been said before, which is about reducing our residual waste as businesses, domestic waste, but you know, to, to basically tackle that as a society and as a country, not just here in Calderdale. So those three things um, lead our monitoring and enforcement, uh, lobbying and pressing government for change. Um, in terms of some of these planning and environmental permitting processes and an appeal to everybody to reduce waste. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Jane, and uh, I'd, I'd endorse all of those. Um, not seeing colleagues at the moment. I, I have a question which I'll, I'll, I'll put to Ian, but 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 Parser or may, may more appropriately need to go to, to Ryan Carroll from Environmental Health. Um, and it does sort of touch on just points that were raised here. I just want to be clear about. Um, so Councillor Mrs. Carter made a couple of comments about things that were not explicitly referred to in the conditions of the permit. Um, I suspect the answer will be that if they're in the regulations, then they apply whether they're explicitly referred to or not. But I, I just wonder if you could get clarification on that. And the second point is the point Mr. Kranz made about em enforcement, where he he stated that the the permit does not need to explicitly say that um, uh, that cessation of operation operations could be, could be enforced. That effectively that is one of the sanctions that is that is open to us in the event of a breach. I I don't know any whether there are more legal questions for you or practical questions for um, Ryan. Sure, I think they're very similar questions, and um, hopefully Mr. Krantz indicated that the uh, permit is not exclusive. It sits in front of uh, the regulations that govern the operation of a site uh, of this type, uh, and those regula regulations have to be complied with. And if there is a breach that leads to um, a real risk of imminent pollution, then the regulations provide for the ability for the regulating authority to uh, impose uh, an immediate suspension of the operation. Uh, similarly, Councillor Mrs. Carter's uh, point about uh, the uh, regulations not being specifically referred to, well, they still apply. The regulations aren't 
um, disapplied just because the permit does, uh, doesn't refer to them in, in, in specific detail. They sit there anyway in the way that any uh, piece of legislation which is applicable to uh, the regulation of a site of this type will, will, will be available to, to the council as the regulating authority. I think Councillor Patient also had his uh, hand up just after uh, Councillor Scullion indicated a desire to speak. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Scott. Yeah. No, that's all right. Thank you, Leader. I mean, a lot of the points um, have already been well rehearsed there, but just to just to echo really the issues that the application definitely demonstrates the weaknesses in the current legislation um, in terms of, you know, surrounding the planning and licensing of incinerators. Um, we, I mean, our hands are tied, really, in a way, and I, I, I think this sort of illustrates where we are with it. And actually, more broadly, you know, earlier, I, earlier, I presented a paper about putting a million pounds of the budget, you know, towards climate change, and this very much feels at the other end of the scale to that. And I think more broadly, this is about what that policy looks like. Um, you know, it, it's passed a legislative test in terms of emissions. Um, but what does that mean for us here in Calderdale? Um, getting to net zero means actually fundamentally changing how we do things and really moving towards that reduce, reuse and recycle model, um, moving away from that throwaway society that actually needs, that that actually is the reason that, put, that, uh, that facilities like incinerators exist in the first place. So a fundamental shift is required. We are very much do do have our hands shackled in a way by this, and I think actually what we really need um, collectively is to change our ways, and we also need to be asking government to change the way they allocate and provide legislation for things like incinerators going forward. So, yeah, that's that's all I've got. Thank you, leader. Thank you. Any other cabinet colleagues with questions or comments? Um, so, so I'll sum up my my uh, my my take on where we are. the The principle of there being an incinerator was at, at this location was clearly established by the planning inspector through the planning process. And 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 although there are separate issues around the um, the certification, I, I I understand where the applicant is coming from when he says we cannot reopen what are planning issues. We can only consider those. I think we've we've done everything we can to assure ourselves about the robustness of the evidence by not only having an officer's recommendation, but by also getting an independent consultant's report, which I think in the the context of the lengthy controversy about this was the right thing to do and should not be seen as in any way um, undermining our officers. It's simply a recognition of the, the strength of the public consultation and, and concern on this. Um, I suspect that in terms of the um, the data, because this will always depend on modelling, there will never be certainty. And as I understand the arguments that are being put to us, what the consultant concluded in terms of the air was that although you can question the, the usefulness of some of the modelling, even if it was within any reasonable bounds, it would still not be sufficient to suggest that the incinerator would be breaching the um the rules that that as i understand it is what the consultants are ar are arguing with the what's saying in terms of the public health overall i think the as i understand the legislation is what it's telling us is that um yes we have a responsibility an absolute responsibility around public health but the assumption is that the within the legislation is that if the incinerator meets the laid down standards, then that satisfies that test. And that's one of the areas where, particularly in terms of some of the unknowns about air quality, I think many of us would have doubts about the current regulatory regime. Um, I don't know if that's a fair summary. Um, I mean, I'm not I'm not clear, given that, that there, there is any credible basis on which we could ask for ask for further information or do other than to agree the permit, but I don't know what other, where other colleagues are on this. Uh, Jenny, yeah. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, 
uh, and again, like you, I'd like to thank everybody that's been involved in putting forward um, their views on this. Um, and I note and I welcome the, um, the assurance given in Mr. Krantz's um, presentation that there is a strong recommendation, that there is recognition that, um, that the permit conditions um, would, 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 um, would make it kind of axiomatic that in the event that um, the operation were, um, were giving rise to pollution which would endanger public health and that, would, and, and that, that such a breach would be um, grounds for, um, for imposing immediate cessation of operations and so on, which I hope will give some, um, will give some comfort to people who are concerned about what will happen should, they, um, should the permit be granted. Um, so I think that the I think the discussion tonight has been very um, has been very comprehensive, um, and I thank all the um, the members and Mr. Pickles and Mr. Krantz for their uh, their opinions. Um, and I am, uh, in a, as I said, uh, in a sense, I am reassured by the recognition, the all round recognition, that our monitoring and enforcement regulate uh, duties as a council um, will be will be strictly adhered to and um, and observed, um, you know, and properly observed by the applicant if the permit is, is granted and there's an understanding that the, the information which is gathered, um, you know, will be, you know, can be inspected and so on. So with that in mind, depending on what else um, is, uh, you know, there may be other, uh, you may want to invite other people to contribute later, but if not, um, I am, um, I'm happy to move the recommendation for the permit be granted. I'll, I'll second that, it's only fair to. Are there any other questions or comments from cabinet members? I'm not seeing anybody indicating. So can I see all those in favour then, please? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, we do have other items on the agenda, so um, we will move on. Um, Item 10, Revenue Monitoring, um, Councillor Dacre. Yes, thank you, Leader. Um, yes, this is the uh, third Revenue Monitor of 20, 2021 and uh, the third and final one. And there's a few comments I'd just like to make about it. Um, it notes our legal requirement to set a balanced budget. It identifies COVID costs and lost income in the region of, to the council in the region of 40 million pounds. But it also notes underlying pressures on the council's budget and states that there's an underlying pressure of roughly 0.9 million, but that that is expected to be reduced to break even by the end of the year. And it makes clear that funding from the government has enabled the council to cover COVID costs when taken together with the council actions during the year to meet existing savings targets, to address existing budget pressures and to contain additional costs within uh, the funding provided to us by government. And I won't go into the details of all of that, but 4.7 and 4.9 uh, set that out in more detail. If there is uh, funding left from uh, the government money at the end of the year, it's recommended that that is carried forward uh, to meet further anticipated COVID costs or losses of income, as clearly the pandemic um, is going on for longer than was perhaps anticipated and costs and indeed losses of income are going to continue for longer than we had anticipated. And again, there's further details about that in the report. Um, the monitor sets out detailed uh, details for each directorate and the steps that they've all taken um, to prevent overspend and bring their budgets under control. And it also notes the importance of the future council decision so that were taken early in New Year in order to deliver savings which have helped us get into uh, this position. So colleagues, the recommendation our recommendations are that we note the current budgetary position and the future pressures which still exist, and that we confirm that directorates should continue to take action to manage their in-year budgets, that we should retain our reserves and balances at as high a level as possible, and that this report be referred to 
strategy and performance scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And um, I second those recommendations and um, also thank cabinet colleagues and directors for the amount of work that's gone on in managing the budget during what's been an extraordinarily difficult and challenging year. Um, can I ask colleagues if there are any further questions, questions or comments on this? Um, I'm not seeing any, so we're happy to agree those recommendations. Can I see all those in favour? Thank you. Uh, item 11, then, is the capital programme monitoring, and I'll come back to Councillor Dacre for this one. Yes. Yes, thank you again. Um, so, yes, this, sets, this paper sets out in detail the forecast capital programme for 2021 to 22 23 and it updates on the delivery of that capital program um, set out um, in the individual directorate programs. It notes the sources of funding, which are that 76% of our capital is spend is funded by grant from government primarily or through West Yorkshire, that 21% comes from prudential borrowing and that the remaining 3% comes from pooled resources of, and revenue and reserves. It, no, it refers to the largest prudential borrowing scheme being that um, to replace our street lighting with LED lights. It notes it's almost complete, that the energy savings from the LED lights are already coming in and they are expected uh, at this stage to exceed the repayments on the borrowing for that scheme, which is obviously extremely good news and a perfect example of how you would hope that prudential borrowing would work. Um, the report also sets out the expected capital receipts from property sales that the council is hoping to realise. Um, and the report makes two recommendations that we approve the capital programme um, set out in Appendix 1 and that we refer the report to strategy and performance scrutiny. And clearly the capital programme has increased since the last occasion, but then I think everybody who's familiar with this will recognise that it, it fluctuates as funding comes forward um, for schemes as they progress, and that's exactly what's happened here. So those are the recommendations, colleagues. Thank you, Sylvia. Again, I'm happy to second those. Um, are there any questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Uh, Jenny, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, I'd just like to um, commend the section on... Um, the Beach Hill Capital Programme um, and to note to draw members attention, cabinet members attention to the fact that not only are we now on site for the 105 new homes anticipated in phase one of the Beach Hill regeneration, but we hope later on this year to be actually to be able to be able to start on the refurbishment programme for the 70 existing homes in Beach Hill. Um, and I'd just like to thank all the officers and colleagues at Together Housing who've been involved in in both schemes because I think it's absolutely tremendous and the only other comment I wanted to say is that I am looking forward very much as I'm sure many many other people are in Calderdale to us getting started and getting shovels in the ground for the Mixenden hub um, which will be uh, which has got some terrific plans for it um, and I'm, I'm really really hopeful that that will be um, we'll be seeing things coming out of the ground later this year for the Mixenden hub um, but again, thanks to all the officers that have been involved in working on that, that and all the, the other schemes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jenny. A any other comments? In that case, can I see all those in favour of the recommendations, please? That's agreed. Thank you. Um, item 12, sorry, nearly, nearly got that wrong. Capital investment strategy. Um, Sylvia, we'll st come to you again. Yes, thank you, Leader. Um, this lengthy document um, sets out, if I can summarise it in this way, it sets out policies and principles by which the Council manages its capital and its investments. Um, the whole of it is designed to maximise benefit to the Council and minimise the risks. And it sets out the internal and external checks that take place throughout the year to ensure that those any risks are um, minimised. Um, there's one change that I'd just draw attention to in the tre Treasury Management Policy, 
where it's proposed to increase the amount that the council can hold on its in on call account at the bank and that's simply to deal with the fact that we're receiving large amounts of money from the government to pay out on business grants and it's so that we can access that uh, money readily to in order to pay out um, i don't think anybody would thank me for going any more deeply into this particular document and so i just uh, commend the recommendations which are to approve for recommendation to council the five strategies and policies listed at 3.1 in the document to and um, to approve for recommendation to council the operational boundary and the authorized limit for external debt for the next three years as, as set out at paragraph 3.2 thank you thank you sylvia uh, again um any questions or comments not see any notice that this is a recommendation to council i think I think I'm right in saying it's on the agenda for Wednesday, Ian. Is it? It is, Chair. Yes. yes, yes. So uh, more opportunities. In that case, I'll second the recommendations. And can I see all those in favour? Thank you. Um, that brings us to item 13, the lead city region business rate pool. Sylvia. Yes, thank you. Um, colleagues may recall that at the last cabinet, we were advised that um, the finance officers of the relevant authorities in this pool were considering the benefits and the risks of the pool this year, given the economic certainty and the risk um, to business rates. All have now decided that there's a low, very low risk of triggering the safety net, which would require member authorities to meet any shortfall, and all have therefore decided that they wish to participate in the pool um, so that they can benefit from any um, business rate growth. And um, in the light of that, um, the recommendation is that Cabinet ratify um, Calderdale's participation in the Leeds City Region um, business rate pool for 2021-22. Thank you, Sylvia. Obviously, there's, there's been a lot of discussion um, amongst with, with officers to make sure this is this is the right action, and I, I, I'd agree with that. Um, so if there are no questions or comments, can I see all those in favour? Thank you. That now brings us on to item 14, the budget reports, which were um, circulated just before the start of the meeting. Um, so there are four items there. We would normally largely present these formally, as of course they will all be for decision at, um, at full council now, at the Budget Council. Um, but I will just ask Sylvia to introduce each, each of the first three briefly. So Sylvia, the revenue forecast. Uh, yes, thank you, Leader. Uh, yes, so it, it simply updates um, us on any changes since the publication of the consultation budget and assists us in determining whether we wish to alter our recommendations. Um, there, I won't go through any of the points, I don't think it's necessary, but the recommendation is that um, there isn't anything obvious that would lead us to want to make any changes and therefore we note the updates uh, in the report uh, when we come to make final decisions uh, at Budget Council. Thank you. So the recommendation is simply to note that. Are we agreed? Thank you. Um, 14B deals with scrutiny, scrutiny board recommendations. Again, Sylvia, is there anything you want to add to this? Uh, well, no, just to say that various comments were made. Um, I'd simply ask that cabinet members um, note those comments. And um, again, uh, no formal recommendations to take forward. Thank you. So it's recommended we note the comments from scrutiny and thank them for their consideration. Can we agree that? Thank you. And 14C is a report back on the budget consultation. Again, Sylvia, I'm going to start. Yes, thank you. Um, I do want to say a little more about this. Um, obviously, the report sets out the different bodies, that, the different ways in which the budget consultation is taken has taken place. Um, in particular, however, it um, did have a consultation with one of the, uh, with some of the staff at, at Colesdale Council and concerns were raised both by them and in one of the scrutiny panels, which I attended in their scrutiny session which expressed a concern about the reference to uh, reduced pension contributions. And I just want to take this opportunity 
to make it absolutely clear that this does not refer to or affect the pension or benefits that employees will receive when they become entitled to their pensions. It is simply about the current contribution that the council is being requested to make to the fund based on actuarial calculations. Um, so I just want everybody to be absolutely clear that it's not suggesting that the council are putting less in to people's pensions and they're going to get less out. Um, so other than to try to make that point clear and to reassure people on that point, simply say that the recommendation is to note the comments to date and also obviously to consider any further comments that are made up, up until the time of Budget Council. Thank, thank you, Sylvia. Um, it's fair to say that the, uh, the the Facebook Live that we did was 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 very lively and entertaining and had lots of questions, but not necessarily particularly directly related to budget proposals, but it was still a, a very useful, informative exercise for us, I felt. Uh, Jenny. Yes, I'd, thank you, Leader. I'd just like to support the comments by Councillor Dacre um, relating to the pension. I, I'm one of the councillors who serves on the West Yorkshire Pension Fund um, investment panel and on the joint advisory group um, and all local government pension funds have to undergo an actuarial valuation which is basically making sure that the investments and income which the um, which the fund has are sufficient to meet its liabilities um, going forward some 20 to 25 years um, and uh, there's been a significant improvement over the last three years in the um, in the value of the fund, which now is at roughly 15 billion pounds, and that means that we've got. If I think at the last, I think I'm right in saying that um, we have our liabilities, our future liabilities, covered to the extent of 106 percent. Um, so that's been what has enabled um, the the contributions, the employer contribution this year, to be to be held um, at the at the level that they're held at. Um, but yes, to reinforce the point that Councillor Dacre made, that this in no way, um, this in no way has any kind of um, bad impact um, on anybody's um, pension uh, pension. On the contrary, it's a sign. Uh, it's a sign of the, um, I suppose, the good management really of West Yorkshire Pension Fund going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And just to note that Councillor Scullion is declaring an interest as a beneficiary of the fund. So I'm sure that that will make sure that's noted. Oh. Well, I'm also a beneficiary, <laughs> so I'll declare it as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so agreed that we note and note those and thank, thank the people who contributed. Thank you. So finally, the, the cabinet, oh dear me, the cabinet budget proposals, as you would gather from the um, from the previous items and the fact that there is um, no significant change in the council's financial position at this point. There is um, no change to the cabinet proposals from the draft proposals that were circulated a month ago, and we're simply recommending those for referral to council. So, um, as colleagues want to comment, can I can I ask that we all agree that? Is that seconded and agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes the business for this evening, and um, welcome and. Uh,